Before we jump into today's episode, we are excited to announce that we now have an email address. You can email us with questions, comments, or thoughts on future episode topics at podcast at falconscreativegroup.com. Again, that's podcast at falconscreativegroup.com. You're listening to Experience Imagination, a themed entertainment design podcast presented by Falcons Creative Group. Every episode, we discuss a new topic with a panel of creative professionals. Hi, I'm Cecil McPurry, President and Chief Creative Officer of Falcons. Hey guys, this is Avanov. I am sitting down with Cecil. Hey Cecil, how are you? Good, how are you doing today? Doing good. Uh, today's topic is authenticity. And I ask this question to you at the beginning of every episode, and I feel like it's gonna be a, a more weighted question today. Why is this topic important? Authenticity. Wow, it is, uh, <laughs> yeah. it's a heavy one, right? I think it's important because I think it's really a big part of our culture here at mm -hmm. Falcons. When we do design and when we execute stuff, authenticity becomes a common design filter within the process that we do. And that might not be obvious to people. And so I think it's exciting to talk to. Who is joining us on today's panel? Joining us today is Stephen Ricker, Jesse Allen, Tyler Capo, Jason Amber. Awesome. And we'll circle back with you at the end for uh, your final thoughts. Excellent. All right, let's begin with introductions. Let's start going around the table with you, Stephen. Hi, I'm Stephen Ricker. I'm the Associate Creative Director. I'm Jesse Allen. I'm the Editorial Director. I'm Tyler Capo, and I'm the Associate Production Manager. And I'm Jason Ambler. I'm the Executive Producer and Director of Production. Fantastic. Thanks for joining us today. We're here to talk about authenticity, which is a very broad topic, and it's a very important topic to Falcon's creative group. Uh, so important that this conversation could literally go in an infinite number of directions, and in order to really hone it in, we actually had an internal focus group uh, beforehand with everyone in this room and with a couple of other folks on our team to figure out exactly what this episode could entail. And as we did some research and internalizing of, of the topic of authenticity and, and what it means to us, we ultimately came up with this definition, which we will use to kind of segment our conversation. To be authentic is to be true to fact, true to fiction, or true to self. And we'll talk about all three of those topics. Sound good? Sounds great. Mm -hmm. Cool. So let's start with true to fact. How is factual authenticity successfully achieved in a physical space? Research, 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 man. All right. <laughs> Stephen, good answer. The best example I think that I can come up with right now is the Heroes and Legends space project that yeah. we did for Kennedy Space Center. You know, a lot of the, the task for that was create these great stories based on actual interviews from astronauts and looking through the historical footage and documentation from NASA. In that, you find stories that you couldn't even dream up, yeah. right? Like it's the whole <laughs> truth is better than fiction. Yeah. You know? And um as you know, like Tyler and I dug into that further and in reading a lot of the biographies and audio biographies from these astronauts, the stories that came from that were like, hey, did you even know this happened? Yeah. I mean, you think you know a subject and then you do the deep dive and it just opens up. You, know, you could never so, have made it up. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. And then trying to understand to the, the actual moments in, in history, uh, I mean, you know, especially with Jim Lovell, talking to him, you know, on the phone, uh, that first initial phone interview, you know, asking him questions that he didn't typically get asked or, you know, I think he even said that uh, with some of these things and got these amazing answers about, you know, him walking on the beach with uh, Charles Lindbergh, right. uh, yeah. you know, watching wow. uh, the Apollo mission, you know, lift off. Understanding these kind of personal moments too and, uh, um, you know, knowing to ask those is, is huge. Sure, and just the, the context of what was going on at the time those stories were happening, not knowing what was going to happen. You know, that, that's the part that they convey a lot is like, yeah, sure, you know how history is written, but when you were in the middle of that, <laughs> you didn't know how it was going to end, you know, and, and that gives you a more compelling story to, to build and to present to an audience because now you take them back not only to, yeah, let's recount this cool thing that happened, but also let's recount it and show it in a way of like, this is how they felt not knowing what, the, what was going what was to be gonna the happen, end yeah. result. Yeah. Yeah. Tyler? Um, 
when your physical space has content that is by nature historical or scientific, you have a different sort of obligation in what you present to your audience. In those cases, you have to be careful about not using too much creative liberty to where you get to a point of presenting false information to an audience instead of something um, true to what happened. Yeah. In the case of Kennedy Space Center, one of, the, one of the elements of the exhibit had to do with artifacts. And we had artifacts that we were trying to pair stories with about various keywords like curiosity, courage, and so on and so forth. So to do that, we actually, when we sat down with the astronauts, we actually had photos of those artifacts, showed them the photos, and asked them to recall back on them directly as opposed to coming up with what we... Asking a more broad question. Yeah, or, yeah. or leading them into, oh, tell us about this story we heard about. We showed them the actual physical thing and asked, what does this mean to you? And we found that we were able to get completely authentic yeah. kind of stories from them just by asking a very broad question about it. It sounds like, with, especially with true to fact, authenticity isn't just a layer for extra immersion. It's an expectation for that venue that the guest is expecting, the client is expecting. It's almost the lifeblood of the experience. Yes, especially with someone like NASA, yes. which is, has a long Long history. Long history of that. It has to be, you know, uh, the foundation of everything we do. Jason, I, I think I think we have a few projects that definitely we implore the the idea of authenticity to facts. Certainly, Heroes and Legends at Kennedy Space Center is one of them. Um, I think the projects we've been doing for National Geographic is certainly in that category as well. Right. Uh, National Geographic, when we first started getting involved with their brand and understanding what really um, people recognize about National Geographic is their authenticity, is the fact that they're one of the most trusted, reliable brands out there. In the world. Yeah, yeah. in a world where you don't know what's fact anymore. You know, uh, National Geographic has kind of, you know, always been in the sweet spot of always kind of um, appealing to the masses and, and everybody can buy it and understand. Looking at Kennedy Space Center, uh, you know, when you, you're, building an attraction or an experience for the biggest space nuts in the world that are looking for the tiniest of details. Mm -hmm. So I think we took on a great responsibility in creating this attraction that it would be so detailed, so ingrained, so true to fact that nobody could pick it apart. So just Jesse? to tee off that real quick, a great example is that we was we were doing uh, the large format film for Kennedy Space Center. And we have this Gemini 8 uh, story, Neil Armstrong, Dave Scott, get inside the Gemini capsule, things go very astray as they try to um, hook up to the Agena, and it, they start spinning out of control. Tyler's discovery on that was, you know, they have all the control recordings, like from communications to and from the astronauts. And uh, so I was able to like listen to the entire thing and hear wow. the stress of the voice of the people in mission control, like really like not knowing what was going yeah. on and, and, you know, just the chaos that that situation was, it was so compelling that we're like, you don't even really need to have an actor do that. Like we had actors playing Neil Armstrong and Dave Scott. We literally cut up the original recording from mission control and put that as the response to the actors, you know, communicating down to mission control. So now you have this authentic, story and the authentic, you know, fear that they had that they were going to lose their crew up there. It'd be great to let our listeners hear a clip of that. Let's play it now. That's affirmative flight. All right, Jeff, what about the Agena? No, he says he is separated from the Agena and he's in a roll and he can't stop it. Try the re-engine control system. It might just give us the correction we need. Do I understand he's used all the Ohm's fuel? His rake pressure is down to zero. His all the rake giving him pressure. Okay, let's work on one axis at a time here. That's a great example of chasing the drama. There's a few elements in if you are Chasing the drama. Yeah. That's a really good line. And, and because you have to, even though these are real life experiences, you know, we are still trying to do an entertainment, you yeah. know, doing, trying to t tell stories and make it entertaining and make it engaging for people. So um, that's a great example of chasing the drama. 
it's there. The drama is there. I, Absolutely, I, yeah. I, I like to. I'm a, I'm a crazy history buff, and I like to say that sometimes fact can be stranger than fiction. Mm-hmm. You know, history has. They have the stories. You just have to dive in, and you have to have someone who can dive in and and explore that. Yeah. In that regard, again, to fact, it's important to have a team that can devote time and effort into the research process mm-hmm. from the get-go. You have to absorb everything mm-hmm. that you can find about it and retain as much as you can. And from so many different sources, yeah. from from movies, yeah. from we were reading know, old books, textbooks. I, you know, I love going through old mm-hmm. stacks of plans, you know, coming from a, you know, design and, and kind of build side, yeah. uh, sifting through, you know, 40, 50, 60, sometimes <laughs> a lot older, you know, blueprints and plans just to understand uh, each design detail and, and why that affects it and how that can be um, yeah, extrapolated yeah. and used in the, in the yeah. Design. I think Stephen and I are kindred spirits on opposite <laughs> oh, yeah. ends yeah. about yeah. the history yeah. stuff. So you just have to have someone that's willing to dive in at yeah. either of those points, whether it's a media project or a design project. You've got to have somebody that can absorb the knowledge and then hold everyone accountable because you can't expect the entire team to know every single thing every single fact mm-hmm. just as long as you have someone there that can be the one to be help the walking back encyclopedia yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. and dad uh, just help back the team up and yeah. you know mm-hmm. give the information when it's necessary and keep an eye on it I, I i really am curious to see how this conversation evolves as we head into our second chapter which is talking about uh being true to fiction So my first question in this category is how does the research and design process that we've just been talking about uh, differ when working uh, to be authentic to fiction? Which, real quick, I think maybe we should also define what we mean by fiction. That could be folklore. It could be mythology. It could even be a story that's technically based in history, but because it's so ancient, it's being reinterpreted, or or because of the nature of the venue, it allows us to take a bit more of a creative license with a historical story than we would in some of the previous venues we were talking about. Right. Well, for me, you know, fiction and, and storytelling in general is always, you know, there's always some reference out there that, that you're, or influence that you're kind of pulling from. So in, in the case of Battle for Ire, which was a VR motion simulator ride we did at Bush Gardens in Williamsburg, that was in the Ireland zone of the park. And so we wanted to tell an Irish story. So we, we did actually do a very similar process to what we would do in a, in a fact-checking sense where we were digging into Irish mythology and storytelling. And, you know, we were looking at a VR attraction. We didn't really know how that would be wrapped in an Irish story until we found this whole mythology about the Irish other world. We saw that as a perfect vessel for virtual reality and the idea of this fantasy other world that then you can see. And so then we started pulling stories from the other world, from Irish mythology that, you know, the character names, the places that they go to are kind of iconic landmarks reimagined. But we were able to take that influence and then pay homage to it, but also then kind of break through the boundaries of having it be factual or have it be so grounded and we can really have fun with it and kind of push the limits. You know, there's an authenticity in these mythic stories and and the power of mythology that has really captured, you know, humanity's attention for as long as we've existed. You know, even even in in the case um, for Battle for Ire, you know, the the names that we chose were translated into Gaelic and kind of had influence uh, and descriptors that applied to that character. So, for instance, one of the main characters, which I I remember pitching in a meeting as a badass warrior fairy, and, (laughs) and you know, it was very well received, Uh, her character, yeah, because it's like, who doesn't want that, right? And, um, you know, really what, what, came out of that was, hey, we need a we need a, a name that really is fitting. So I think we went with Ednat, which meant, meant fiery one. Little okay, flame, cool. Yeah. Little flame, fiery one, um, being, you know, the fact that she's also a um, a fairy size. So mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, I, I really like Battle for Ire. My uh, uncle was a mythology teacher uh, in Denver okay. for 25 years. And when they said, hey, we're doing this project about Irish mythology, I'm like, Oh, I got the resource, and I remember bringing in that stack of books. It was like Finn McCool and all this like <laughs> yeah. Irish mythology stuff, and 
it is so cool to see those types of characters that have historically been in that culture for a very, very long time come to life. You know, you got like, I, my favorite, of course, was the Oliphist, the dragon, you know, uh, which again is kind of this enigmatic creature and Irish lore, you know, this kind of unusual type monster. Uh, and to, you know, not only like bring it to life, but bring it to life in a completely new context of like, you know, this guardian that also kind of partners up with you. You know, yeah. uh, it's just a fun adventure. Steven, sir? Well, I think that's, uh, you know, an interesting point, uh, you know, how we can play and have fun with these characters that have existed for, you know, millennia. I mean, and still being authentic to who they are, you know, especially with folklore and mythology. There are many different kind of tales and nuanced interpretations of these characters that can kind of yeah. let them fit into various situations, but, um, you know, still understanding at kind of the base archetypal level what these characters are, who they are, uh, why they are, and understanding that um, to really hold up the authenticity. Jason? Yeah, I you know, I think authenticity to fiction, in, in my mind, is also involved a lot when we're working with big brands that have these great narrative properties, IPs mm. that that we've been able to have the privilege to work with, whether it's, um, you know, Cartoon Network properties, Marvel properties, um, Lionsgate and the Hunger Games. Um, I mean, there's, there's quite a bit out there that we've now been able to help realize with the help of IP partners and, and the brands and the creators of these stories um, themselves. And that's really a, a big part of our process, I think, in these other attractions as well, is we like to go to the show creators and, and understand the essence of what the show is about, the mission statement, what is really their, driving them in their storytelling and in their effort, because then we can help to apply that as a filter and how we're designing and building. Jesse? Yeah, you know, I, the thing I always like about how we go about this is it's very similar to the approach that we had with some of the historical stuff is that you're taking stories that uh, aren't just like a recap of what happened, but expanding on that universe. Mm -hmm. So when people go through those experiences, they feel like it's like a missing chapter and yes. a bigger yeah. story. And that's where you really pull in the fans as they're like, hey, you know, there's this little element that I didn't know about. Or mm -hmm. they yeah. picked up on something that the film just glossed over or the, the story just glossed over. And they've expanded on that and kind of gave us a little more insight. Yeah. I think that's a great point. I think in, in any attraction that you know we do, we want people to feel like they got a little something out of it you know a little something new or that they didn't know before um, and not rehash right let's talk about what the process is like when you are trying to be true to a fiction that you are creating so there's a, a few I think projects that we've done and I think Stephen can jump in here that we've done in the past that definitely fit that mold I think you know we uh, Bona Hills in Vietnam is a great example of something where we birthed the storyline, so to speak. Um, it's and a then, custom IP. Yeah, exactly. It's something that we created from the ground up. But in that process, we created, you know, certain kind of guidelines and design filters. I think that becomes our way to stay authentic. Um, there's also Dragon's Treasure in Macau was, was another one where we applied story. And then I think another one, a great example is, is Atlanta Sonia. And I'll kind of hand it off to Steve. Right. I mean, these stories become what we hearken back to at every step of the way. Mm -hmm. You know, Atlantis, uh, this was, you know, Atlantean kingdom built for an earthly person to experience the, uh, the princess Daria. This was a kingdom built for her so that she could experience the underwater world while in her, you know, mm -hmm. land bound form. So a lot of those details really... Uh, translate into the actual design you know you enter and you stand face to face with the guards of the kingdom a very harsh very military militaristic uh, representation you know of a tank that houses these crustaceans these lobsters and with very harsh angles that they need to grasp onto but serve as the gate and then you move into the court of the jester with uh, the beluga whales um, so this kingdom actually has a, a linear journey to it that is that reflects the playfulness or the seriousness. And, you know, this is also a story that no one will ever really read. The guests aren't really briefed on this is the story. This is, you know, these are the characters. This is what they did. This, they lived happily ever after. 
It's something, though, that really defines each step we take on the creative process of why we're making these decisions. And together, they make up this uh, collective, this holistic story that feels more complete. You know, basically, uh, spectacle without story is just shallow, right? Yeah. And the audience will pick up on it. So really, all you have to do as a designer, as a creative uh, visionary on that, is to sell them on the plausibility of that story, you know? And if they buy into that, then right. you've succeeded, right? They just go, hey, it might not totally make sense to me, but it feels right. Yeah. You, and like in the case of Dragon's Treasure, it feels like it's part of our culture. It feels like this is something that could have been derived from our mythology. I don't need to believe that the world could exist in my world. I just need to believe that the world has its own internal logic. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, let's move on to our last chapter in this conversation. Uh, authenticity to self, being true to self. My first question is sort of simple, sort of maybe opening Pandora's box. What does it mean to you to be true to self in this industry? Well, I think it's it, to me it's about being um... – yeah, obviously professional, but honest with the people that you work with and not being afraid, really. I mean, a lot of it comes with experience and getting comfortable. But to me, in order to be truly authentic, you really have to be able to open yourself up mm -hmm. to and be vulnerable, right? So you need to be putting yourself out there um, and comfortable and in a comfortable environment to do that, right? Because there's a lot of places out there where people don't want to step up or speak up. I think one of the things that Falcons does really well is that we listen to kind of everybody and, and we really don't close any doors for people. So with that, you're allowed to be vulnerable. You're allowed to kind of expose your 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 feelings or your thoughts or your suggestions. And, and we take ideas from anywhere and we're proud of that. Um, and so um, I think that's, for me, part of being authentic. You know, I always like to describe our, our, our culture here at Falcons as a high-functioning, laid-back you know, we do a lot of work and we're, we are always pushing the boundaries, um, you know, not only just kind of industry wide, but for ourselves too to become better and better. But there are no egos here, which is something I, I find really special. It's all about how can we create something bigger than ourselves, greater than the sum of our parts. And I, I think that's a really critical and really amazing thing to have. Yeah, I, I think really it's just about fostering the passion with creative people, when you kind of get into that collective of passionate people yeah. and, and they start coming out with all these ideas and you're like, well, you know, that's fantastical. Well, that's even, you know, bigger and more dramatic than I expected. And you contribute your ideas and it just kind of snowballs into this incredible thing. Uh, and then that's the thing that you present back to your client and they're like, is that possible? And, <laughs> and we're all like, yeah, <laughs> you know, so give us a few yeah. days. Yeah, exactly. well, I mean, typically, whatever we present, we've already thought through it like ten times, and and yeah. and like tried to break it, and know that it's going to be rock solid. But <laughs> I mean, you know, we we like to think of ourselves as authentic, not only internally as a company culture, but also in how we deal with clients and vendors and, and people outside of our company. I think that's you know, something we really pride ourselves on and are known for in the industry as someone that cares about whatever project or whatever creative thing we're working on, someone that's not going to give up, someone that's going to go the extra mile and, and over deliver when, when needed and take ownership of whatever we're designing or building or whatever, because, you know, it's our name on it too. It's our reputation on the line. But we also just, we truly care. We don't really work on anything that we're not passionate about. If you are authentic to yourself as a company, you're going to instill that confidence for the client right. that you will be authentic to the facts and the fiction. This was a really interesting conversation just because of, again, how many different ways authenticity could go. And it's, it's a really, really fascinating conversation. And uh, I'm really glad that uh, you guys could join us to, to talk about it. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Thank Alvinoff. We want to thank our panelists again for a, a really incredible discussion on a topic that is just so meaningful and important to us and to our industry. 
Cecil, uh, any any final thoughts right now? I got emotional. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it's especially with some of the brands and the IPs that we've dealt with in the past, and even just our own personal brand. I'm constantly amazed at, when we talk about our process and our journey. We just go through it naturally, but to focus on it, it's refreshing, and I think it's kind of enlightening almost. One of the things that really got me excited was what Steven said. Falcons is high functional, laid back. Yep. <laughs> I, I, I've never heard that described before, but I understand it immediately. It's accurate. You know, I, I live in and breathe it. I come to work and I see it. And it's cool to hear it being described that way. It's exciting to, to share that. There is no ego here. One of the things that I took away was the phrase, I think it was Jason who said it, we chase the drama. And I think that was when we were talking yeah, about true to cool. fact. I think yeah. that's such a great way of describing it because as opposed to creating the drama from scratch, you know, you're using real life, which is chock full of drama. Yeah. The word of chasing drama, it's not being untrue to the facts. Right. It's being focused on what you want to elevate and how you want to create the cadence of your storytelling with that yeah. medium. It's a quality control that is powerful. And I think oftentimes we do post mortems on our projects and realize that it's because of our tenacity and due diligence yeah. of being authentic to our stories that have uh, circled back to, you know, saying that's why it's successful. Cool. Well, we announced at the beginning of this episode that we now have an email address, uh, podcast at falconscreativegroup.com. And we definitely urge you to reach out and communicate your thoughts. Please, please do. Uh, questions about anything that we've talked about in an episode, ideas for future topics that you'd love to hear. We may even do episodes in the future uh, where we do like almost a mailbag sort of episodes. Mm -hmm. So, and we may select uh, ideas from yourselves and circle around and talk to that. So, very exciting. Well, Cecil, I want to thank you for joining me on this really my awesome pleasure, discussion. My pleasure. My pleasure. Very exciting topic. Yeah. Well, that's the last episode of 2018 and the end of our first year doing this podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Again, please reach out with any questions or comments and uh, happy holidays. This has been Experience Imagination. For more information about this episode's discussion, be sure to visit our blog at falconscreativegroup.com. And don't forget to follow Falcons Creative Group on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram.